So five minutes ago, I kind of ran through what kind of shape the city is in, and it, it's in, it's in tough shape here in COVID, uh, with reconciliation, uh, the needing to uh, address the systemic racism, uh, homelessness, and and the overdose crisis. So, um, so we've started to put forward solutions. So nobody can escape uh, what was happening at Oppenheimer Park and now in in Strathcona Park, and what we're what we're having to do to deal with the day-to-day -day work of the city, as well as to address these, I think it's the, really what is the biggest homeless encampment in the, in the country is to start calling special council meetings, is that we can't actually get through the regular business of council and at the same time deal with these extraordinary crises. Like for example, getting special uh, patio licenses issued quickly enough to keep businesses alive. So, um, so that's really uh, what, what the, one of the tools we've been using to try to address this problem. Meanwhile, trying to keep some of the planning staff, uh, trying to keep some of the planning staff thinking about the long term because that that is so important. And how will this all change both our social and economic uh, makeup? Uh, one thing uh, I, I tried to do just last night was to try to propose a, a pilot project, to propose a pilot project that would uh, look at our 68,000 uh, basically single detached home lots uh, in the city and find a way to perhaps make them more affordable to, uh, to folks. Uh, under this uh, making a home scheme that I, that I uh, proposed was that uh, you could build up to four uh, strata units on a, on a single, uh, single detached lot as long as you had put in up to two additional units that were permanently removed from the market. Uh, so that folks could buy them, but they would sell them back at a, at a much reduced rate. And uh, had lots of hope for this, but unfortunately, uh, council really killed this uh, last night. So I'm back to the drawing board, trying to push things ahead with housing affordability, at least for the uh, those folks who find themselves in the in the missing middle. Um, where we've uh, cooperated well on council, though, has been through the Modern Income Rental Housing Pilot Program, and and really what that is is trying to, realizing that we're in a, uh, a housing market that's dominated by the market, uh, you know, 92% of the units, is, and most of the units coming online are gonna be built by the market, is to try to bend the market uh, so that we can get more and more housing uh, paid for by using the local tools we have. So this MERP uh, housing uh, pilot program at 20% of the units in these uh, basically rental buildings from kind of five to, you know, just over 20 stories, 20% uh, of these units would be for uh, households making between uh, 30 and $80,000, and they would be permanently protected uh, for the life of the building. So we've actually passed 10 of those buildings, uh, most of them uh, with good, healthy council majorities, and we've got a whole bunch more to come with the pilot project having up to 20. So I do talk to lots of other mayors about this, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we do this on... Um, we do this on uh, on public land. I said, no, no, this is private land. This is land that's owned by uh, usually a, a larger developer, but who wants to build rental uh, instead of condos. And we're starting to get some some units that are affordable uh, for folks that are starting to come online, uh, which is exciting because then we can have like working people living in the neighborhoods where they're working. Uh, so. What's really important here though, and what's at the core of all the decisions that come out of my office is that the health and safety of vulnerable residents need to be the top pri priority in not only our pandemic response, but in our long-term uh, long planning. So uh, how we do this, of course, is we're always in constant contact with the three host nations, but also now starting to make better inroads into the very large urban indigenous population that are away from their home territories. And when you look at uh, all the stats to do with policing or with, uh, with health or with, with, uh, with uh, housing shortages, Indigenous folks are well, well overrepresented in, in all of these, uh, the not good categories in, in terms of, of, of folks that need the most assistance and, and hands up uh, to get, uh, really to have, have lives that are, that are much better than, than many are currently having. So, uh, how do you combine all these things, reconciliation, uh, dealing with uh, vulnerable populations in a very market-oriented city is, is the challenge that I think all planners are gonna face uh, and, and academics and, and theorists is how do, we, 
how, we can have good ideas, but but how do we pay for them? Uh, but also, how do we kind of fit them into the current structure uh, that we have? Um, the thing is, is that a lot of these uh, a lot of these issues are interconnected. Of course, poverty, housing, homelessness, overdoses are are all interconnected, and uh, and very, very challenging. But the problem is that a lot of the funding and policy comes from three different levels of, of government and four if you count the regional level. So the trick is to try to coordinate these is really, and that's really how I see my job as mayor. Uh, Justin McElroy uh, jokingly calls me the lobbyist in chief, but, but what I've been really trying to do is to, is to tell the federal government where we need, what kind of money we need and work with other mayors to do that and then pitch particular projects uh, to get to land the money here in, in the city to do the same thing with, with the province. And so um, I've been able to do that. I probably landed, I don't know, probably half a billion dollars at this point, uh, whether it's for childcare spaces or uh, rent subsidies for, for workers uh, in, in permanent buildings or uh, social housing units, uh, all of those kind of things. Uh, that's, that's really what I put my emphasis in as well as trying to get things uh, through council. Um, so I'll perhaps end there. Um, I guess I really, I'm, maybe I've given the impression that I'm on the, feel like I'm on the front line here and, and I really do. Uh, you know, when I was an academic, I. I love to hang out with political philosophers because that was really the the most uh, you know uh, I know your brain I think goes to the places that you never thought it would go when you're looking at political philosophy and then what I liked about urban studies was uh, was that it merged the theoretical and the practical uh, in the in, in the federal realm when I was a federal MP it all seemed theoretical all the time and then you'd all vote on billions of dollars and you never know where it went really. But at the city level, it is, I think, uh, the place for me. I, I enjoy taking a time out and, and having uh, conversations with smart people about where the city should go. Uh, I love the theory, but in the end, it's all about helping out the most vulnerable in our city, I think, and, and making it a, a city that works for everyone. So uh, I've probably taken my 10 minutes and maybe a little bit more than that, but just wanted to thank you so much for, for listening to me and happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mayor Kennedy, for that overview and for that dispatch from the front lines. Uh, I think many of us who are uh, political and planning junkies have been wondering how, uh, it, what it's like uh, to have to deal with this uh, particular crisis and particularly have to keep your eye on so many other balls that were already critical before this uh, pandemic broke out. So appreciate your overview of that. Uh, you've also given me uh, a new phrase, uh, having Amazon Prime expectations, I think is a pretty good summary of, uh, of some of the sentiments that are out there today. So uh, thank you very much for that. Actually, I have, to give my wife credit. I have to give my wife credit for that one. <laughs> that <ash. laughs> okay, well, I'm the Amazon junkie in our household, so uh, I'll say my greetings to her anyway. Uh, our next speaker is Jennifer Kiesmat, who's the CEO of the Kiesmat Group and the former Chief City Planner for the City of Toronto. Um, she is a passionate about creating places uh, where people flourish, and she was named one of the most powerful people in Canada by Maclean's and one of the most influential by Toronto Life and one of the top women of influence in Canada. Jennifer is a distinguished visitor in residence emeritus at the University of Toronto. In 2018, Jennifer founded the Keysmat Group, a creative group of senior level urbanists who work with future oriented cities, regions, companies, and organizations to advance solutions to some of the most pressing challenges of our time. And certainly Jennifer and her colleagues came to our attention uh, when we were planning for this seminar and webinar uh, because of the declaration of, uh, for resilience uh, in Canadian cities that she co-authored with a number of other uh, distinguished people. So uh, I'll now call on you, Jennifer, to give us your remarks. Thank you very much, Ken, and hello, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be with you virtually um, this evening from across the country. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the urgency that we face, and I'll be picking up on many of the strands in Mayor uh, Kennedy's presentation and kind of linking them together and hopefully drawing them into a framework for action, which is the 2020 Declaration for Resilience in Canadian Cities. 
And I want to begin by saying this, that if there's ever been a moment in history when it's been apparent that we have a dire and stark choice about our future in front of us, it is this moment right now. We have a public health crisis. We have a climate crisis. We also have a social justice crisis. And on top of that, we have a housing crisis. But of course, all four of these crises are linked together. They're one and the same. And addressing them and overcoming them and really uh, creating a way for humanity to continue forward into the future is going to demand us thinking strategically about all four of those crises together and collectively. And this is actually a pretty hard thing to do. Um, we like to pick teams. We like to identify this is kind of, this is my issue and I'm going to, uh, you know, dig my heels in and I'm going to fix my issue. But I would argue that it's impossible to fix any one of these issues without fixing all of these issues. So there's, there's a level of complexity that we're dealing with in this moment in history that can be quite intimidating and can lead us to inaction. The challenge is, it became very clear at the beginning of this pandemic, I would say back in April or May, that there's, there's really a fork in the road. There was a growing discourse, which has continued to be perpetuated across the globe, that cities are part of the problem, that we're going to uh, retreat from our urbanism because our urbanism has given us all of these challenges. Our urbanism has given us a public health crisis. Our urbanism has given us a climate crisis. Let's face it, it's where our environmental footprint is the greatest. Our urbanism has given us and demonstrates the incredible disparities in wealth uh, and racial inequalities. We see that in our cities. And of course, access to housing and exclusion from housing, which is of course a basic human right, is something that is most transparent in our, in our cities. So pretty easily, pretty quickly, there's been a bit of a pile on with respect to cities and a, a risk, an identification that we need to somehow retreat from our city building. We need to go somewhere else. The great urban project as of, let's say March, 2020 was dead. Well, in fact, I think we're calling it too soon. I beg to differ. And I beg to differ because I believe that we actually need to go deeper into our urbanism. And this is critical for our long-term planning. The risk, of course, is that we continue to repeat the mistakes of the past. And we've made incredible mistakes in our urbanism and in our city building. It's one of the reasons why many of these challenges are so present. They're so in our face. But on the flip side, we know that our urbanism holds the potential, it holds the opportunity to upend racial division and systemic racism. It, it holds the potential to address our climate crisis. It holds the potential to create healthier places for living. We're, we are more in harmony with nature as opposed to being in complete conflict with the natural world. Our urbanism actually offers all of those things. And it's for that reason that we penned the 2020 Declaration for Resilience in Canadian Cities. Recognizing that there was a fork in the road, recognizing that there was retraction from our urbanism, we essentially, a group of urbanists across Canada, we asked the questions, what would a vision look like? What would specific actions look like that would in fact drive us deeper into a resilient uh, urbanism. And that's really what you see in the declaration, the 2020 Declaration for Resiliency in Canadian Cities, which of course has been signed by academics and developers and environmental activists and land use planners and architects and designers literally from coast to coast have signed on to this as a statement of really hope for action for the future. Pulling together the 2020 declaration was really about asking the question, if we were to make this easy to identify the starting points, the key actions, the things that we can do now that we've sort of missed in the past 10, 20, 30 years in our urbanisms, the things that we could do right now that would put us on the path towards a more resilient future, 
what would those things what would those things look like and we begin in the declaration with a recognition that our current urban form has had profound detrimental effects on new canadians on indigenous people on racialized populations and on lower income workers and a recognition that these groups and we've seen this accelerate during during covid these groups have disproportionately suffered from the effects of homelessness and gentrification, as well as growing racial and class-based segregation within our cities. And so if we can begin with that acknowledgement and that recognition, it can position us to begin to be strategic, to find and to bring an authentic equity-based lens to our city building and start identifying some of the actions that are going to move us away from this disastrous path that we've been on. And so we identified in the 2020 declaration and Rachel has put into the chat the link to the declaration if you want to look that up as, as I'm talking. We really divided the declaration into three key areas. The first one being ensuring the, respons the responsible use of land. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that, but, but some of what uh, Mayor Kennedy was talking about in his presentation actually started to get at some of the actions that e exist within that framework. The second is accelerating the decarbonization of our transportation systems. And let me just say, this isn't just about throwing up bike lanes all over a city. Nothing could be more pertinent to long-term planning than accelerating the decarbonization of our transportation systems. Because one of the reasons we've ended up with the long commute, whether it's on transit, whether it's in a car, is because we failed to create complete walkable neighborhoods. We've sort of bought into the idea of the long commute as being foundational to urban life, as being foundational to modern life. And upending that is something that we do more so through our land use planning than any other kind of initiative that we can embrace in our cities. And the last area is embracing sustainability in both our built and our natural environments. So within those three key areas, beginning with the responsible use of land, we essentially identified key tangible things that can be done now. And this is really critical because one of the risks that we see in our city building across this country is that we have a propensity to punt the ball down the field. Mm, there's not much change that's actually within reach. Most of the change that we can see in our cities, mm, it's decades away. It can't happen right now. And in fact, I would argue we've been gaslit in many of our cities, for example, around cycling infrastructure. What have we seen in the past six months? We've seen a fundamental trans transformation of mobility in cities around the world. Paris has led the way, but then we've seen smaller places like Oakland, California, New York fell into line. Now we're seeing it in London. Toronto is incrementally getting there. We've seen some big moves in Vancouver as well. We've seen bike lanes that we've been told there's no money for and that need consultation processes and long environmental assessments. We've seen them built with the snap of a finger, approved on a Monday, the construction teams are, are complete by a Friday in our cities. We need to take that as a clue that much of the change that we need to see to transform how we see land, to transform how we move, to transform our buildings and our natural environments and cities, much of that is entirely achievable. It's entirely within reach. It doesn't take some multi-year consultation process to redo all of our land use planning. I honestly think that's a very 90s approach to change. The approach to change that we must embrace, including right now in our long-term planning, is to recognize the urgency, the, the terrible haunting truth of this moment in history is that there's no technology that will save us. There's no invention that we need to invent to transform our cities to become more resilient. There's no new construction material or construction methodology that's required to provide housing for everyone. None of that is true. It's all entirely within reach. We know exactly what to do. 
And it takes a combination, I believe, of a groundswell of constituents at the grassroots in cities who advocate and demand change from their leaders and leaders who have the tenacity to lead, to do what needs to be done in this moment. And of course, um, one of the stars of this moment in history is the mayor of Paris, who, who's transforming Paris. It's not been easy. She's already had a campaign that's been undergoing, she's been undergoing for five years. And she's ended up at the Supreme Court in France, people opposing uh, her integration of bike lanes, opposing the removing of cars from the downtown core. This has been fraught with opposition and legal battles. But she's done something in incredibly uh, profound. And it shouldn't be, but it's something that we see every great leader does. She's led with a vision and very clear values that she has been unwilling to compromise. And I would like to suggest that that's at the core of creating resilient cities in the 21st century. You can take a look at the declaration. There is, are 20 very specific actions that will have transformative impacts in our cities. Everything from enacting a moratorium on the construction and reconstruction of urban expressways and highways, uh, containing suburban sprawl. Uh, we like to think of ourselves in Canada being on the er leading edge of our urbanism, particularly in places like Toronto and Vancouver. But we must confront the brutal truth that across our country, 75% of new housing built over the past decade has been in car oriented sprawl. It's been a mistake. It's been a form of land use that is fundamentally irresponsible. And look, we, we've known for a long time how to design communities where we have a much, much smaller environmental footprint. But the truth of the matter is that hasn't been the bulk of our urbanism. We know that in Vancouver, 82% of the land is primarily zoned with single family housing, maybe some duplexes and granny flats are allowed in there as well. Toronto's not much better. The number one action in the declaration is around adapting our existing low density residential neighborhoods, which is the vast amount of serviced land in this country. It's the land where we already have transit, we already have community centers, we already have parks, we already have schools, and this gets right back to social equity because we know these are not inclusive places. Uh, this, they're kind of like last in the door, save, save, save all your money, get in the door and then shut the door behind you. This is my neighborhood, no one else can come in. I would argue that that's antithetical to creating long-term resilient walkable communities that are based on 15 minute neighborhoods and complete communities. It's antithetical to that. And that's why the very first action in the declaration under the responsible use of land, which is all about both a just and a green future for our cities, is all about transforming access to existing neighborhoods by encouraging appropriately scaled multi-tenanted housing, laneway housing, other forms of gentle density to be built as of right alongside houses in, in existing neighborhoods. And that's actually a starting point that links back in to creating places where we have diversity, diversity of incomes, diversity of housing types, diversity of tenure, instead of having so much ownership uh, as uh, Mayor Kennedy pointed, pointed out. The key point that I would like to highlight for you here is that we're at a moment in history where we really have a choice. It's actually, it's not more complicated than that. We have a choice about the kind of world that we want to create. And on the one hand, we could go deeper into our urbanism, which is also about going deeper into creating green and just places to live in the future, or we can retract. We can retract. That's a choice too. And the 2020 declaration is a framework for advancing, I would argue, a very hopeful future where we embrace doing the things that we can do right now to advance transformative change, instead of thinking that it's way out there and that we need 
some kind of technology or some big funding mechanism uh, to advance change. The truth is we can advance change today. It's a choice that is before us and transforming our design, our policy frameworks and how we finance both infrastructure and housing in our country is going to be foundational to advancing that change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, uh, for a very inspiring presentation. Uh, as, a, as a planner myself, I have to welcome your emphasis on the responsible use of land, which is really what cities come down to uh, at the, at the, in the final analysis. Uh, but I think you touched on another piece of territory, which is the territory here uh, between our ears. Uh, and um, we have a chance, I think, uh, now the people's minds perhaps are opened up by these uh, these dire events uh, to revisit and rethink and reconsider where we're going. And you've given us with not only your presentation but also the declaration a great deal of uh, raw material for us to to work on in that regard. So thank you. Our next speaker is Heather McNell. Uh, Heather is the general manager of regional planning and housing services at Metro, and in the First of those roles, she is a successor uh, to me from with about 23 or 24 years between us. Uh, and uh, she has more than uh, 20 years of experience in land use and transportation, housing, growth management, uh, parks planning at the regional and local levels. She leads a talented team responsible for two areas, regional planning, uh, whose response role is to develop and steward the regional growth strategy and Metro Vancouver housing which is a non-profit uh, providing affordable rental housing to more than 9,400 residents uh, at 49 sites in the region, and I believe is the second largest landlord uh, in British Columbia, or at least in the region. So um, Heather, uh, we look forward to, uh, to your remarks and to hearing uh, what you've been doing and trying to grapple with this question of long-range planning in the middle of, of this uh, dire epidemic. Heather? Thanks very much, Ken, and um, very appreciative of the opportunity to participate in the webinar today. I do have a, a PowerPoint, so I'm going to share my screen uh, just a little bit here. Bear with me. And I just want to make sure that folks can see that. Can folks see that? Okay. So um, I've been asked uh, this evening to talk a little bit about um, Metro 2040, our regional growth strategy, and we're in the midst of updating that and how has COVID impacted our learnings around um, uh, long range planning and, and what concepts remain relevant, uh, if not critical, as Jennifer was talking about, which ones uh, require a radical rethink and what lessons do we need to incorporate. So I'm going to start, um, if I could, just by giving you a quick sense of, of who regional planning is. Uh, this is a group of planners at the region who really uh, work hard to uh, uh, support planning throughout the region. So that's with regards to our utilities planning, our member jurisdictions planning, TransLink and other, other regional agencies. Their kind of raison d'etre is about the regional growth strategy. And I think of the team pretty much as stewards of that. You know, it's really reminding our member jurisdictions and others that we've signed on to a vision for how to manage growth in this region. Um, and we also just do that by providing a whole host of core services. And, and the first really is about providing projections. So we look out 20, 30, 50 years and provide projections for population, housing, uh, employment, et cetera. We provide uh, policy research to support uh, planning throughout the region and other core services as shown here. So Metro 2040 um, is essentially the regional federation's vision for how to manage growth in a way that really reflects the values of the federation. Um, it was adopted in 2011, and it has a really high bar when it comes to uh, adoption. Every single member jurisdiction council, so 21 municipalities, one treaty first nation, and an electoral area, all sign on to this. Adjacent regional districts, so Fraser Valley and Squamish Little Wet, TransLink, and Metro Vancouver. So it is a bylaw, and it is signed by all of those folks. Um, has some core principles that uh, far precede this particular plan that are kind of contingent to, to on, on what you've already heard already from Jennifer and, uh, and from Mayor Stewart. 
Um, but I'm putting them up there to kind of double down on, on the kinds of things that Jennifer was talking about. These are the things that work. And our regional growth strategy is, is sort of centered around ensuring that we do put growth in the right places uh, to a network of urban centers around the region and along transit corridors. It's centered around protecting important lands, our food lands, our ecologically important lands, our job lands with a focus on industrial. And it's really also about supporting our member jurisdictions as they uh, set out to create uh, amazing communities throughout the region, um, providing diverse and affordable housing, supporting better mobility. Um, and I would also say that there's the flip side of urban containment is around ensuring that we can provide a lot of urban infrastructure efficiently. So sewer and water service, transit, et cetera. So back about a year and a half ago, our board gave us direction to uh, take on a, a comprehensive update to Metro 2040. It'll be called Metro 2050. Um, but it really was seen as an update. So this is around building on success. This is about uh, really working from a strong foundation of those principles and, and a recognition that the bulk of the strategy is working well. But we do need to extend it out to 2050. We do need to ensure that we're working hand in glove with TransLink as they update their regional transportation strategy, because uh, we always joke that a good transportation strategy is a good land use plan and vice versa. And after 10 years of, of implementation, there's really an opportunity to fill some gaps um, and to uh, really put an emphasis on, on uh, climate action, on social equity, uh, on making sure we're building affordable housing near transit, et cetera. And all of these issues, as already spoken about tonight, are accentuated in the kinds of environment that we're, that we're in today as a result of COVID and, and other issues. So um, as uh, Mayor Stewart noted, we had a whole host of issues kind of building up to this. And then in March, uh, COVID happened. And, and what we started to hear, um, as Jennifer alluded to as well, is, is, you know, there's these conversations about, wow, why should we be planning for the long term when such major unforeseen things can happen with massive impacts? And what does this mean for cities? And will the ability to work from home actually mean that people will live in different places and travel in different ways? And so as a result of that, our board tasked us to go back and say, what does this mean uh, for Metro 2050? And we came back and said, you know, we don't want this to become a COVID response plan because then it'll be outdated in a couple of years. But we can really build things like COVID and the pandemic into ensuring that we build a resiliency lens. And as we've heard tonight, as we've peeled back some of our learnings in the last six months, it's become imperative to really look at an equity lens as well. Um, we also were tasked to redeploy our resources to support uh, uh, emergency and recovery planning throughout the region. Um, Metro Vancouver struck a COVID-19 response task force, and this is comprised of all of the mayors in our region. And they really have two roles right now. One is to uh, guide Metro Vancouver's actions and responses. We still are providing services around water provision, sewer provision, affordable housing, et cetera. But it also provides the mayors an opportunity to connect and share information about how they are addressing uh, recovery in each of their communities. Regional planning provides uh, data on a monthly basis for housing uh, uh, with regards to job loss and recovery, mobility challenges and patterns, and land use uh, markets. We've also provided some population growth scenarios to kind of give a sense of what um, a tampered uh, immigration means for a couple of years with regards to long-term growth. And Jennifer actually has presented to the COVID response task force with regards to the 2020 declaration. And we're looking for ways to embrace that in this region and find ways to embed some of the actions of the, of the declaration into the regional growth strategy update. So I'm just gonna go back for a second to why bother planning uh, to kind of uh, follow on Jennifer's comments. And you know, we have to look back a ways, but we've, we've often heard throughout history, whether it's Winston Churchill or Dwight Eisenhower, the plan itself is not the important part, it's the planning. The tangible thing that we create is vulnerable to a lot of disruptors and forces that are outside of our control. But planning, of course, is about exploring and thinking. It's about looking at variables and raising your awareness and giving you a more complete and um, useful perspective. And so in this world of fluidity and 
fairly great uncertainty, I think it's imperative to look at planning not as a prescriptive activity, but as uh, a resiliency building activity. It's a guidance tool. Um, for us in regional planning, it's really essential to create common objectives and common goals uh, because we're working across many boundaries to address some really uh, complex challenges. So we cross boundaries, whether it's jurisdictional or geographic or generational, and those common goals are essential towards collective action. Um, planning, of course, helps us uh, hedge bets when it comes to uncertainty. It helps us build resiliency. It encourages innovation and gets us thinking about intersectionality. Uh, Jennifer talked about the four kind of crises that are at a, a cross point right now, and it's an opportunity to really think about all of those together. Um, when we do our projections, we do do a trend forward analysis. We do look and say what's been happening with regards to population and, and what do we know about today and what can that tell us about the future. But we also, by definition, do scenario based planning. And we uh, want to look at a myriad of factors that are beyond our control, such as automation and technology, uh, geopolitical shifts, and so on. These are things that dramatically shape our region's future, but in ways that we can't always reliably predict. And all of these kinds of actions or out external forces can have impacts on how we grow, uh, how people move, where they live, um, and how they get around. And so again, that scenario-based planning is an opportunity to manage uncertainty and to identify strategies that'll work in a whole variety of circumstances. So for me just tonight, when I was thinking about what kinds of planning concepts remain relevant, um, what kinds of things require a radical rethink, where do we need to double down? I have three observations and one conclusion. So my first observation is that humans are creatures of habit. Um, and, and we've talked about how cities have been a big gravitational, had a gravitational pull for, for many years. And whether that's despite world wars or whether that's about natural disasters or other pandemics, we gravitate to these places because if done properly, and uh, you know, Jennifer talked a little bit about the ways that, that cities have failed as well, but if done properly, these are incredible outcomes that come out of our cities. Uh, we have quantifiable physical, mental, and emotional health outcomes. We create innovation hubs. We have amazing neighborhoods with good connection. We have access to culture and artistic diversity. Um, and, and, and as humans, we, we do connect positive feelings with familiarity. So my sense is that we will continue to, to move towards um, urbanism. My second observation really is that, wow, as a species, we're really uncomfortable with discomfort. And, uh, and I'm gonna just give a bit of an anecdote with regards to that. About two years ago, Metro Vancouver and TransLink um, embarked on developing long range growth um, and transportation scenarios. And how we did that is we took a look at a whole host of external forces. Some of them are just list listed on the left-hand side of your screens. Um, taking a look at how these things that we don't have a lot of control over as local governments will impact our region. Um, and that's the axis, uh, the vertical axis. And then also how certain are we about how they will unfold in our region? And we kind of high graded three, three main areas around climate change, uh, global economy and trade and automation and technology as the ones that were really the outliers that we don't have uh, a lot of sense about how they're gonna unfold in particular, but we know they're gonna have high impacts. And around that, we created four different scenarios. And some of the scenarios really were about like, what happens if automation is great and we end up with a green economy and everybody can work from home and everything looks rosy and population growth is managed. Um, and everyone that we participated in our process thought this was a great desirable future. But when we started to look at things like uh, what happens if there's global economic collapse? What happens if we close our borders and we see zero population growth? There was a real discomfort in including these as scenarios, let alone embracing them as things to really look closely at. And I guess my point in that is it's, it's challenging to have the, the courage and the vulnerability in planning to stay with discomfort, to include discomfort, to make sure we're including dissenting voices because it really makes that planning practice so much stronger. Uh, my third observation is that, um, and it's also been noted this evening is, wow, do we ever have adaptive capacity when it, there's an immediately present crisis. And I think that pivot really is a uh, word of 2020. You know, it was very early in the pandemic that we were tasked to redefine our sense of what an essential worker is. We were um, um, really grabbing onto the fact that, you know, it's, a, it's almost a, a, 
a trope right now, but that we have all in the same storm, but in different boats. So really acknowledging that, as again was noted tonight, that Indigenous and racialized and low-income people are experiencing this pandemic in a very different kind of way than others. And that really leads us to this willingness to have hard conversations that can lead to new policy. And that like links back into the declaration. But we also saw some incredible pivots where we all stood on our patios at 7 p.m. every night and applauded and thanked our essential workers and sought hope together. We saw rapid repurposing of hotels uh, to, to address homelessness issues. We saw the reconfigured public space immediately um, and streets taken over to create public space. And Jennifer talked about the cycling infrastructure and how fast that happened. So in an immediate crisis, we definitely have that ability. Um, but then that brings me down to the punchline for me, and, it, and it's a bit of an oxymoron, but it's, it's really about doubling down and being flexible at the same time. Um, and what I mean by that is doubling down on those fundamental planning principles, and that reflects what Jennifer's talking about, diving deeper into urbanism. They work, so we're still containing growth, we're putting growth in the right places, we're protecting important lands. Um, but we do need to differentiate between doing that well, which is good density, and differentiate that from crowding. So from my perspective, good density is a planning issue, crowding is a social equity issue, and maybe we can explore that in the panel a bit. I think it's important for us to be vulnerable and embrace this uncertainty and embrace discomfort and ensure that we include it in uh, work that we're doing because that enables us to make those big moves uh, in policy and particularly around social equity issues. Um, and I would also heighten the, the urgency of these issues right now and, and acknowledge that now, now is the moment. And I look forward to questions as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, very interesting overview of, from the burning deck <laughs> about how to uh, combine uh, adaptation to a, a crisis with uh, keeping the, your eye on the long range planning ball. Um, and uh, none of us who are involved in cities would not, uh, uh, sorry, none, none of us who are involved in cities uh, would disagree with the discomfort that people have with uncertainty and uh, the attitudinal emotional issues that we, we have to deal. Also want to thank you for uh, the quote from one of my heroes, Winston Churchill, uh, who, uh, who, who did show some outstanding leadership in a crisis and um, uh, I didn't know that he was a fan of planning, uh, but we certainly appreciate that quote that plans are of little importance, but planning is, is essential. Certainly my mentor, uh, the late Peter Oberlander, would uh, certainly agree with, with us on that. So thank you very much. Uh, our, our next speaker is Yunji Kim. Uh, Yunji is an assistant professor uh, in the Graduate School of Public Administration at Seoul National University in Korea. Uh, her research focuses on local government service delivery, public finance, uh, community development, and community well-being indicators. She received the doctor, a doctoral degree from Cornell University, her master's from the Graduate School of Public Administration at Seoul National University, and a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University. Uh, and in our preliminary discussions with the panelists, uh, she shared some very interesting insights about, from her perspective, having had them. Um, uh, completed her, her postdoctoral edu edu or her doctoral education in North America and then returning to uh, Korea in the time in a time when um, uh, this crisis was just uh, breaking on us. So she uh, she has some observations about uh, impatience and um, longer term planning. So uh, I will um, call you on you now, Yunji, to give us your presentation. All right. Good day, everyone. I'm Yoonji Kim, and I'm the odd panelist who's going to talk about how South Korea responded to COVID-19. And I do have some slides that I will put up right now. All right. So uh, I had a brief moment of panic when I realized the title, The Pandemic and the Impatient Nation, which I had submitted about a month ago, had nothing to do with my presentation. But uh, I, I realize actually it, it connects quite well with the, the punchline of my talk, which is that Korea has shown remarkable speed in getting back to what looks very similar to pre-COVID-19 life. But in that impatience, we are losing something very important, and that is democracy. 
So I have four parts to my presentation today. Uh, I'm going to talk about first, why do we care about Korea? And then second, how did Korea respond to COVID-19? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, why are we seeing this type of response in Korea? And then lastly, what has changed in Korea? So starting with why do we care about Korea? Uh, this is a map showing the uh, number of total confirmed COVID-19 cases per million people. And here is South Korea, it's in the, the tiny green circle. Um, and you can see that, so the darker the color, the more number of cases per million people, the lighter the color, the fewer number of cases. So Korea right now looking at uh, the situation globally has uh, quite few number of cases per our population. And then this map is showing the share of COVID-19 tests that are positive. So it's uh, out of the total number of tests that a country runs, the number of tests that are positive as a percentage. And here the, the range goes from blue to dark red. So the dark red means uh, the more number of positive cases per, uh, per test. And the more darker blue means that the fewer number of positive uh, test results as a percentage of total tests that are, are, are done. And again, if you look at Korea here in the, the tiny green circle, we are pretty dark blue. So this means that uh, the, the positive rates on our COVID-19 tests are pretty low, uh, below 1%. And according to uh, a WHO uh, guidelines, a positive rate of less than 5% is one indicator that the epidemic is under control in a country. So I think a lot of people uh, globally are interested in Korea's case and how we responded to COVID-19 because uh, relatively speaking, Korea looks like it's, it's got COVID-19 kind of under control. So how did Korea respond? And here I'm going to talk about uh, kind of two, two sides of the responses. So how did society respond? And then how did the government respond? And I'll start with how the society responded. And that is, everybody went out and bought masks. Uh, this is a, a picture, I think, from early uh, January where people were already lining up in front of pharmacies to buy these masks. Um, we pretty soon after that had a mask shortage problem. Um, and I think this is because uh, Koreans have been kind of used to wearing masks, uh, mostly because of air quality issues uh, in the past. And that was one thing when I moved back to Korea last year, I was walking around without a mask because I just, I wasn't used to it. And people you know, in the elevator would ask me, and this was before the, the COVID-19, panic, but on days when uh, we were supposed to be having bad air quality, I would have neighbors asking me, oh, you forgot your mask. Why aren't you wearing your mask? So society responded, going out, buying masks. Uh, and then how did the government respond? And there are two responses, I think, that the, the Korean government uh, took on that, that's really um, noted internationally, and that's, that's our testing and tracing. And so for in terms of testing, um, the Korean government was very active in, in testing as many people as possible. And this is where we had our, um, I think by now, well-known drive-through testing uh, facilities set up where you could just drive up in your car and um, be out of there in, in 10 minutes with your, your test result. And then the second was really detailed tracing, contact tracing for, for people who had tested positive for COVID-19. And of course, the, the tracing was also raising um, some early on concerns about data privacy, uh, and especially for uh, people who would be considered um, in, in vulnerable populations in, in Korea. So why did we see these responses in Korea? Um, I would say kind of two reasons. The first is our experience with past crises. Uh, this goes all the way back to, I think, 2003, where we had a big uh, fire in our, our metro, one of our metro stations, and, and a lot of people died. After that, we had uh, the SARS epidemic in 2003, and then in 2014, we had a huge ferry disaster, um, and then after that, in 2015, a big earthquake, and of course, in 2015, also our experience with MERS. And 
I would say all of these past experiences with these crises led to a lot of changes to our crisis and an emergency management laws. So I'll give you two examples. Before MERS, uh, these, the testing for these uh, epidemics was limited to the Korea Centers for Disease Control. That's our kind of version of the, the US CDC. And um, that really slowed down a lot of the, the testing speed during, during MERS. And because of that, they've, they've changed the laws and now uh, dealing with COVID-19, we were able, we, we've changed the legislation where now private companies are allowed to do these tests. And so again, that helps um, with the government response of doing as many tests as possible in a, in a short frame of time. And then the second example is that after MERS, uh, the legislation changed and now says that the Minister of Health and Welfare must make information of confirmed cases publicly available. And this information includes their travel route, their means of travel, where they were treated, like the hospital they were treated, and persons that they came into contact with. So again, this, this really came from our experience with MERS, where uh, there wasn't as much information sharing from the government during MERS, and, and citizens were not happy about it. And so uh, again, our, our impatience really led to that, that, changing, uh, that change in legislation. Another reason uh, that explains this response in Korea is really the, the, the culture, the, the strength of social norms. And so um, we have this, this uh, stronger collectivist culture, at least compared to the US and I think also to Canada. Um, and we also have a, a very rapid uh, sharing of information through social media. And that has meant that a lot of people are scared of, uh, of contracting this, uh, this disease. And especially, I've, this is a direct quote I've heard from my friends here, you know, they all say, don't be patient zero. You do not want to be patient zero at your company. So uh, this little cartoon here is, is kind of showing, you know, this, this guy who's been, uh, who's battling COVID-19, he tested positive for it, he's, he's lying in the hospital. Um, and people are blaming him, saying that you, you are the cause of our company shutting down and going out of business. So um, just anecdotally, there's been a, a, a little survey that's gone out and more people were saying that they are more afraid of becoming patient zero for COVID-19 and um, becoming kind of a, a social pariah than they are of you know, the possibility of not recovering from this disease. So again, it's the, the strong collectivist culture and, and strong social norms that I think um, has prompted people to really wear their mask. So getting to, I think, the, the main uh, meat of this, this talk is, so what has changed in Korea? And I would say that on the surface, not much. Uh, we have our middle school, high school students going to class in person. Um, public transit is operating as usual. I think the buses um, will stop running a little bit uh, earlier, but I've, from me taking the, the metro and buses here, I don't see um, less density on these buses or metros. And you know, people are out and about. Um, of course, everybody is wearing masks, but I would say on the surface, it looks very similar to, to life in pre-COVID-19 times. But that's not to say that we haven't lost anything and things are just normal. Uh, I do want to point out that we have lost two things. And the first, I think, is our loss of collective goods. So um, I, I found it very interesting uh, hearing from the other panelists that, you know, you guys are talking about this, this question of density, you know, do we, do we still pursue density? Is that something we want? And I think for, for Korea, that's, that's never a question. We were always a very dense society. Um, that's kind of how our cities were built. And so uh, that was never a matter of question. Um, but, and this density really allowed us to be a more equal society in the sense that we, we can have collective goods. Um, so one example I want to talk about is exercise equipments. If you go to any public parks in Seoul, you'll see a lot of these exercise equipments. Anybody can, you know, walk up and use them. But during COVID-19, uh, a lot of these were, you know, kind of taped up and you weren't allowed to use it. 
And now this isn't so much of a problem for those who have the financial means, right? So during COVID-19, one uh, kind of hot keyword that was trending was uh, home training. Everybody was, was getting into home training, right? But that, that assumes that you have a space, you live in a space that has uh, the room for you to, to kind of jump around and move around in your house. And it also means that, you know, you have the, the financial means to, I don't know, buy home training equipment or maybe even get a personal trainer to come visit you um, or, or get any type of uh, uh, home training videos, et cetera. Um, that's not true for everybody. So if you don't have the financial means to be doing that, uh, you've now lost your, your free, free gym and uh, opportunity to, to get some exercise in. A second example is uh, these cooling centers. Um, and we've already mentioned that, you know, yes, 2020, we're dealing with COVID-19, but even before that, we were dealing with climate change. And we're seeing that in Korea as well, where, where we've been seeing some very extremely high temperatures during the summer. Um, and again, not everybody can afford to have an AC in their, their house or even uh, afford to pay their electricity bills for that. And so one way people, one way the government has dealt with this problem is these cooling centers. So these are usually community centers where uh, you can walk to, it's fully air conditioned, you can go in there, maybe uh, just kind of chill out, read a book, whatever, talk to your, your neighbors. Um, all of these cooling centers also had to be shut down over the summer. And so again, that was becoming, uh, that's where we've lost one, one other collective good. And, but again, this is something that um, we've lost, but it's kind of in the shadow, right? Because it's, it's not going to show up for people who have the means to, to have an AC in their own house or, or do home training on their own. The second thing that I think we've lost, and this is uh, the, the punchline that I mentioned earlier, is our democracy. So um, very early on in, in February, uh, Seoul had already, the Seoul government had already banned all types of political protests. Uh, and this was really interesting because Korea never really had a lockdown. Um, the closest we got to lockdown was, uh, I think, a week ago, where for about two weeks, uh, restaurants and bars were supposed to close at nine o'clock. Um, you were not allowed to uh, eat your food or, or drink in these restaurants after 9 p.m. So everybody was doing takeout. But I mean, that that level of kind of uh, lockdown has been lifted already. And it, and it only started in early August. But this this ban on political protests um, was put in place back in February. And it became a, a huge issue in uh, in August. Uh, August 15 is is a big uh, national holiday here, and so there was a, a large scale protest, um, which then led to the government saying that you know we can't have these protests anymore. You will be prosecuted if you uh, if you organize such protests or participate in them. And uh, this weekend again, we have another national holiday coming up on Saturday where uh, these. Uh, groups who are not happy with the current government and their policy are, are saying that they were going to organize a, another protest. Uh, the, the government has said, uh, you better not do it. And so the, the response that they came up with was, all right, fine, we will uh, then hold a drive-through protest where people are, are, are all in their uh, cars. And uh, that also went to the Seoul Administrative Court and the court uh, made the decision, I think yesterday, saying that no, you're not even allowed to hold these drive-through uh, protests because it's not safe. So again, what I'm worried about is democracy um, in that we are you know, responding very quickly to the, the pandemic and kind of getting our public services to run as smoothly as possible, but um, in that, in that process, we're, we're losing this, this bit of democracy. And these are things that we don't think about on a daily basis. And that's why I think um, both of these things, the loss of collective goods and the loss of democracy is uh, kind of hidden and in the shade. Another thing I wanna talk about in terms of what has changed in Korea, because I think uh, the loss of collective goods and loss of democracy is too depressing, is uh, something a little bit more optimistic and uplifting. So um, because we've always been a, a dense and close-knit society, 
we are now having to think about different ways to deliver public services without, um, without putting people at risk of, of contracting COVID-19. And one way uh, local governments are doing this is through, and I'm gonna borrow this term from Mayor Kennedy, uh, an Amazon Prime type of service. So uh, this is one local government in Seoul that has come up with this app where citizens can um, put in requests for any kinds of administrative uh, forms. So these could be you know, marriage certificates, birth certificates, or any kind of uh, licenses that you need for your business. You can go into this app and say, you know, these are the forms that I need. And the, the local government will, will process those forms and then they will deliver it to you, uh, deliver it to your door. So that's one way they, they are trying to be innovative with the way they deliver services. And then we're also seeing this in terms of, um, kind of social welfare services, especially for the elderly. Um, this is a, a, a woman using an AI speaker. So this is kind of like Siri or, or what have you. Um, and these services, uh, these speakers have been given out to these uh, welfare recipients where they can you know, have conversations with the, the AI speaker. Um, the AI speaker will also remind them to you know, wear their masks and um, tell them about the, the day's air quality and the number of COVID-19 cases for the day. Um, and also if the, the person using it says something like help or, or emergency, that AI speaker sends a, a direct ping to the social welfare worker who will then visit the home and, and check up on the person. So again, um, while at the kind of national level, we're seeing all kinds of politics that are, I think, using the crisis and kind of the emergency language to push through um, what seems to be problematic uh, policies towards democracy, at the local government level, we are seeing uh, kind of innovation and creativity in terms of delivering services to our citizens. So, that is my, that is all my uh, lesson. I, I think, again, punchline on the surface, not much has changed in Korea, but I think what we are losing is uh, kind of hidden in the shades and that's collective goods for people who don't have the financial means and democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yunji. Uh, very, some very interesting points in there. Uh, your comment uh, about uh, uh, what's changed and what appears to be the same uh, does hark back to a comment by Anthony Pearl in one of our earlier, the earlier version of this seminar, where one could look at the impact of uh, COVID as either disruptive or interruptive, uh, that uh, there's a tendency and a human tendency to, uh, uh, to want to get back to business as usual, to want to have things look uh, to just to, to treat whatever it is as a, an interruption. Uh, rather than a disruption. Uh, and I do think that it's pretty clear that there's a great deal of what's going on that is disruptive. Uh, the other thing that I think you really touched on, uh, and uh, this is, I think, very important, is the relationship between uh, the govern government and the governed. Uh, because uh, I think that um, uh, in terms of a pandemic response and in terms of uh, of a, of a just and, and, and satisfying city, um, there has to be a, a relationship of, of consent and trust um, both ways between the governed and the gov government. Uh, and I think we see some stresses in that, uh, not just in the United States or, or in Korea, but also in, in some parts of Canada. And that of course is, could be a, a really fatal Problem, literally fatal problem for us if we have a breakdown in the level of faith and trust and the willingness of uh, people to do essentially as they're told without, without having to, in each one of them having to be convinced of the benefit of that for the, for the general good. So it's very interesting to hear how that's unfolding uh, in Korea and thank you very much for, for that presentation. We'll move on to our final panelist is Am Johao. And Am is the director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement, and he's the co-director of the Community Engagement Research Initiative. He's worked in uh, on in a various uh, roles, including on the Vancouver Agreement, which was um, probably the first serious attempt to bring together at the street level uh, federal, provincial, uh, and and local government initiatives to deal. Uh, with uh, with drugs and homelessness and crime. 
uh, and uh, he's also a former member of the Vancouver City Planning Commission and been on the board of the Vancouver Community Foundation and a number of other community organizations. We asked Anne to ask and answer the question, uh, whose city is it anyway? And I think that um, what's gone before is an appropriate introduction uh, to that uh, to that presentation. So Anne, over to you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ken. Uh, and thanks to SFU Urban Studies and Public Square for um, uh, organizing uh, this. I'm coming to you from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people, and I'm here at 312 Main Street, the old uh, police station, which is full of all sorts of um, uh, histories and, and complicated uh, spatial politics. Um, whose city is it anyway? Who does it embrace? Who does it marginalize? And who does it push away from legibility? Whose bodies matter and whose don't? Is the right to the city just words on a page? Or are we an apartheid city as former UN Special Rapporteur in Housing Maloon Katari famously called Vancouver a few years ago? In his essay, How High is the City? How Deep is Our Love? Jeff Dirksen wrote, we're often reminded that we love the city, that intimate aspects of ourselves course through the veins of the city we live in, and that a deep affection binds us to the space and places of our city. And we do love cities. Our lives are wrapped in and through the spaces and textures and possibilities of our urban experience. Through the discussion of what is possible in the city, we slowly build up the city's identity and life. Crisis and recovery conspire utopian forms of thinking as the capacity to imagine a future that departs significantly from what we know to be a general condition in the present. Uh, today, there is indeed a desire for urgency and disruption and upheaval that the moment calls for. We can't go back to addressing a crisis with a little bit of Keynesian politics sprinkled here and there. Something more fundamental is being asked for uh, by the moment. The fork in the road was passed a long time ago. Within the crisis, there's the opportunity to reaffirm, adjudicate, and jettison values and expand the sphere of imagination within the everyday experiences of the city. This was certainly the case following the First World War and after the influenza pandemic of that time. And again, following the Great Depression and the Second World War, entire neighborhoods in Vancouver were built with federal government investment. Planning can operate in extremely opportunistic ways. It can bring about colonialism and the Manhattan Project, but can it also bring us public health care, social housing, pensions, employment insurance, and what to make of planning at a time when the world is digitized, financialized, and ecologically brutalized. The possibility of the total mobilization of the state helped reconstitute the field of planning, but it still reeks and performs a parochial transactionalism today. Mike Harcourt likes to tell the story that most of the Vancouver Planning Department management still had British accents in the early 70s. The amnesias of colonialism still pulsed through the city and set the tempo for its limited field of vision. The world is a slippery place and fundamentally reimagining the future only happens in exceptional times. But the possible movement from uh, transactional forms of planning to transformational planning in such a short period should be welcomed. How do we think beyond and around the state and the pantomime of politics that shape planning? We need to think from within the lived experience of the city and its inhabitants and not be bound by the narrow frame of linear rationalism that the thought of planning is often built upon. In times of crisis, as a number of people have said from Marx to Marshall Berman, all that is solid melts into air. There are some questions to pose in the present crisis and the possibility of a transformational planning to come that functions at the scale of the problems that we now face. What form of planning can be articulated and called upon to defend a public interest in times of multiple crises in the near future beyond the one we're in now? We live in cities with racial and economic injustice as built-in forms of peripheralization that follow from centralized planning decisions that are oftentimes made from flawed or narrow assumptions. In the margins of cities, one can see the collateral damage that poor, poor planning has done in not dealing with the pace and scale of capital flows through the city. The human cost is traumatic and devastating. 
You don't need to look further than the effects of fentanyl contamination deaths, tent cities, indigenous and Black Lives Matter protests erupting into public space that were decades in the making. Hiding behind the facade of professional rhetoric in the transactional forms of planning that play out every day in urban centers does little other than reproduce the status quo and move the so-called problems around in public space. Cities need more resources and regulatory power to work around intergovernmental stalemates. Crises perpetuate surveillance tendency of states and the policing of bodies. The next uprisings will also emerge in the suburbs too. The problem is structural inequality. For too long in the region, planning and politics in the service of capital have reproduced and accelerated divides as a normal state of affairs. The disconnection between incomes and housing costs in our cities is but one example. We need to look at new forms of urban indigenous governance and the direct indigenous community governance of social service delivery in urban centers. Planning departments need to be as diverse as the cities they plan for. Not, not much will change without that prerequisite taking place. 80% of Canada's population live in urban centers. How can the pandemic, climate crisis, and future crisis be planned for? And how should recovery be imagined? Who should it be for? How should it land down? Who determines what the recovery looks like and on what terms it rolls out and its attendant effects? For most people, these processes of decision-making are happening in the back room without appropriate forms of engagement. Planning can't be done in a closed room without involving the inhabitants of the city, regardless of their status. Who are we responsible to and who are we held accountable by? The problem of the state is central to any view of planning. For too long, the thinking of planning and its itinerant theories have been sutured to the state. And that has created a fundamental closure of thinking of what might be possible. How can planning rethink its relationship to the state and land politics generally, particularly in urban contexts where originary colonial land theft is still an ongoing reality? Giving back concrete parcels of land to the original inhabitants as part of a process of urban justice and decolonial practices has to be part of that conversation. The urban arena still has the capacity to be an incubator of radical ideas and propositions. The very possibility of liberation within crisis asks a deeper moral question of how to think of a response to crisis outside the state as a place to imagine a radical outside. If the state is the only actor in the response defining the limits of the recovery, then we're ultimately dealing with a parochial form of centralization that is unfortunately baked in with democratic deficits and will exacerbate and accelerate polarization. There needs to be the possibility of agency, participation, and decision-making by the inhabitants of the city rather than just being passive recipients of delegated authority from above. Resilience might just be the bullshit word of the moment. What does a planning that centers social solidarity and social justice look like? If we don't build in the participation of those communities directly affected by decisions, ultimately regulatory force and power decides the outcome. Planning when done well ought to be about reconfiguring power and challenging the surveillance and policing tendencies of state and public bodies. When the pandemic arrived, the existing social safety net was already stripped bare by decades of neoliberal policies. Who gets to imagine what a recovery looks like? Who is in the room? Is contact tracing possible when people don't have a home or a phone? Our public health professionals took a while to land down on whether wearing a mask or not is effective. When public information isn't transparent, trust is eroded. Public health approaches have benefits, but also limitations inherent to centralized forms of planning. Polarization is inevitable and toxic forms of, of population, populism are unleashed. Planning has to be more highly attentive to the production of new solidarities, particularly those that emerge from the periphery. Access to information is limited and isn't multilingual. Some can self-isolate. Charity-based food systems are problematic. And how can we think beyond bricks and mortar solutions? Planners love to build their way out of a problem and building can uh, solve part of the problem, but certainly not all of it. 
uh, where's the guaranteed annual income that's needed? Uh, the $375 uh, shelter rate from the provincial government uh, on social assistance rate the, of the 7,000 SROs, less than 100 rent at the shelter rate currently. If this crisis was a test run for a major seismic event where most of our emergency planning goes into uh, at the city, then it means we're not actually prepared. On the whole, the assessment on the ground is that it's been a very disorganized approach. Government agencies weren't nimble. Its systems are structured on distrust that is couched in an accountability lens. Uh, whereas uh, organizations like the Vancouver Foundation, Van City, United Way, others got 17 million out the door um, uh, quickly. Uh, governments need to pare down systems and focus on empowering community organizations. Communities need to lead and have government support them. Planning needs more uh, hum humility and not assertiveness. Uh, we also, at the same time as these intense moments unfold in crisis, we need to bring back joy and the good life back to the city as well. In the wake of the pandemic, uh, interesting phenomenon of how people use public space, people are drinking in parks, inhabiting public space in new ways, patios are enlivened, and all of a sudden forms of urban punk uh, or urban funk hitherto unimaginable in the Protestant nanny state of Vancouver and its overdone, overregulated liquor laws has turned overnight and accepted a messiness that was existing only in other uh, places. I think people want more permit permissiveness in the city to let us be ourselves. What's next? Dogs on patios? Uh, we need investment in the social infrastructure of arts and culture. That's where the solidarity and the poetry of the city resides and the working through of difference takes its audaciously proper form. We want to live in a city that bites back, that fights back, that loves back, that gives back. For Vancouver, the recovery needs to have uh, investment also in the suburbs, especially south of the Fraser, places like Surrey, um, uh, Brampton in relation to Toronto are the future. That's where the growth is happening. The largest urban indigenous community in Metro Vancouver is currently in Surrey and the city itself will be larger than Vancouver in, in 10 to 15 years. There is explosive growth, but where is the investment in the social glue that binds communities together? Green infrastructure, public transportation, new forms of urbanism and density needs investment in growing suburbs. Density makes public transit efficient. All the precepts of sound urbanism like compact communities, transit oriented or pedestrian oriented development or 15 minute uh, communities uh, make sense intuitively, but here lies the, the caveat. These moves can actually exacerbate peripheralizations and lead to politics of displacement and gentrification in suburban contexts. It can reproduce and accelerate inequality in parts of the city. These urban processes privilege access to capital so the benefits aren't shared. You ever wondered why there's so many real estate billionaires in a small town like Vancouver? What happens when people get displaced from dense urban centers end up commuting from Langley, Abbotsford, Wally, like many of my students have done over the years? It's all well and good to double down on urbanism in a time of crisis, but how does planning deal with that fundamental contradiction that accelerates peripheralization uh, through capital investment? What does a progressive land value capture tax, uh, tax look like uh, in practice, not just in urban centers, but also peripheries? Uh, working from home and other possibilities of technology are certainly differentially uh, experienced as all of us have figured out the past few months. And what does this mean for the future of work? Everyone's home lives are different, but the interruption of the past few months has shown both the upside and downside of this experiment and real challenges to mental health uh, haven't yet been fully understood. We are indeed living simultaneously through the death of an era that was unsustainable and the birth of a new one. There is today an amnesia regarding the upheaval of the world created after World War II. We are grappling with the existential threats of climate change and global scale computation and threats to sovereignty that they pose. Just as the possibility of nuclear war hovers over us as a hangover from the last century and toxic forms of populism, nationalism and hatred are all around us and never went away. Humans have proven to be highly adaptable species that thrive on cooperation, even through the deepest divisions and difference. Democracy relies on the messiness and contingency of dissensus, not consensus. It's in our very capacity to live through difference that new solidarities emerge. 
but to imagine planning in a way that doesn't place sufficient value on both solidarity and dissensus that leaves social, environmental, and racial justice on the back burner is not going to be able to hold the tectonic shifts that are happening all around us. There's a younger generation that is ready to overthrow the system, and we should actually welcome them uh, with open arms. It is possible to inhabit a zone of irresponsibility, of messiness, of a resistance to capture and categorization that can coincide with uh, a proper confrontation with power in terms of the old ways of working. Insurgent planning, when done well, can be a discipline geared towards a new solidarity, a shared consciousness, a responsibility to an identity beyond oneself, a site where legitimate and illegitimate grievances can be dealt with. How high is the city and how deep is our love? That is the question. And how can we be together and how can we be in common in spite of difference? This is where the work of love for the city and solidarity as a moral position comes to be. And if we can't be in ho common, how can we still live together? What through difference binds people together in common beyond the shared geography of place? And this is the work for all of us. And if it is to be actualized, it must be done in the everyday with joy, love, poetry, ferocity, velocity, generosity, and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, I have to say, uh, I guess from a personal, as a personal comment, um, I was born in 1945 at the beginning of the era that we're talking about, and uh, this is the 50th year of my being involved as a professional planner, working on paradigms uh, basically that you describe quite well, working within paradigms that you describe quite well. Uh, I think what you've done is to sketch out uh, a whole new world, a whole different set of perspectives that raise some really important questions for professionals uh, going forward the question of uh, what who does planning serve who do, how do plan it, how do planners serve the public interest uh, how do we include the excluded uh, and, and more questions of that nature so um, I think that uh, I, I'm not in a position to undertake to respond to those but I'm very glad that uh, that you have highlighted them for us and give us a given us a a picture of uh, the issues that we're going to have to grapple with if we really want to have a city that's based on love. So that conclude, concludes our, our panel presentations and we're now moving into uh, the um, questions and answers uh, segment. Meg, uh, if you're there, uh, perhaps you could help uh, us by identifying uh, the first question. Sure, absolutely, Ken. Um, I'd just like to invite everybody to, um, you know, pitch a question in the Q&A box. There are two questions there now. I can start with the first one from Naomi Steinberg. It's directed to Jennifer. How do we find the balance between density and the need for permeable surfaces and open skylines for feeling a lightness of being, especially in a rainforest where the city of Vancouver was built? So this is a really um, critical question and it's really about um, how we balance the intensity in urban environments and different environments have different cultural approaches to what is considered livable and what is considered acceptable and what is considered uh, sustainable. But importantly, in the North American context, in most cities, 25% of the land areas actually are streets, it's roads, it's typically paved over with asphalt. In a city like my city in Toronto, 25% of the land area is, is roads, asphalt. Another 17% of the land area is the ravine system. So the, you know, where we have trails, they're part of our, um, our waterways. Um, and then another 15% uh, of our city is land that is dedicated to park space. So quite a, pretty quickly you start to see that a significant amount of the landscape of the city actually isn't even isn't even buildings at all. So what I would argue is that the area that we do have built form, that we've built up buildings, we need to be thinking about how we can maintain a uh, sky view, maintain access to sunlight, and mitigate 
the impact of the built form, which is why in the Declaration for Resilience, we actually talk about uh, sustainable buildings and sustainable still built forms. There's materials that we know, for example, that are profoundly sustainable and other materials that are deeply, deeply problematic. And the way we design can have a profound impact on that too, as the whole passive move house uh, movement has, has demonstrated for us. So I would say that the appetite for density in relation to the natural environment in a city is something that is very, very local. It's very specific to a, a specific area and a specific community and has to be understood in that way. But there's a tremendous amount of opportunity from a city design perspective. And now again, I'm talking about parks, roads, open spaces, to actually think about how we're constantly reintegrating natural systems and nature back into the landscape of the city. To get this right as a critical starting point is about identifying where growth will go and where growth won't go. And having absolute clarity about where growth belongs and where growth doesn't belong is really essential. When I was the chief planner in Toronto, I initiated a project that was a strategy for our ravine system, precisely because I saw this interrelationship between promoting significant intensification in our existing built up areas as being conjoined with ensuring that the natural systems that maintain human life in the city were also protected and enhanced and also identified in terms of ways that they could provide um, access to nature, both for children, but also for, for anyone living in the city. So I think it's, it's about thinking about how all of those elements come together. It's not just about how tall is the building. The one criteria that I would argue that I'm very passionate about is access to sky view and access to natural light when we're thinking about built form in a city. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Angelus, and Angelus asked a question of Heather, but we might ask it of uh, other panelists too, Ken. It's, um, yeah. it's about the notion of resilience and it's about the role of non-human nature. So Angelus says, thanks Heather for pointing out the difference between density and crowding. It seems to me that people in general, if they have the option, move to cities that are more than just housing and services. I feel that cities will become truly resilient if we all have a radical shift in the way we think. We need to understand and come to believe that we are not the only species that has a right to live in any given place. The solution will involve multidisciplinary teams, planners, designers, politicians, and the community at large that will create more density while protecting and restoring the environment we all human and non-humans need to survive. Sure. Shall I take a crack at that? Is that the? <laughs> yep. Um, I'm actually going to start with what, um, where, where I was headed in that, and then I'll move into answering the question. So the place I was talking about around differentiating between density and um, and crowding actually had to do with social equity issue issues piece. So when you're looking at hot spots of where COVID is popping up, it's jails, it's meatpacking plants, it's seniors care facilities. Um, these are, are places that are crowded working conditions. And, you know, in dense, wealthier neighborhoods, you're not seeing the same kind of transmission rates. You're seeing it in lower income neighborhoods where people take transit, where there might be essential lower income workers like grocery store workers, where you might have five people living in a one bedroom apartment. And so I think that um, density has been demonized in this conversation where a lot of the issues um, around, around um, crowding should be uh, analyzed and taken a look at from a social equity perspective. Um, in terms of access to green space, I would say, you know, it's critical. We've seen our park usage during the pandemic increase by over two thirds. And so people are clamoring for outdoor space. We know that access to green space gives you uh, quantifiable health benefits. From an ecosystem um, support perspective, we know that nature needs half. It's, it's kind of a common uh, mantra right now. And, and what we've found in Vancouver is over the last eight years, we've lost the equivalent of eight Stanley Parks of sensitive ecosystems in the region. And a lot of those are happening in areas that are slated for development. And what that means is it kind of harkens back to the last question. We need to take a look at how we do density 
Um, and so we've done some work looking at um, urban canopy cover and permeable surfaces in relationship to different kinds of uh, development types. And, and what we found is that the, the kinds of higher density development that was built in the 80s, that kind of center to, um, uh, tower in a, in a, in a park-like setting actually has significantly more permeable and tree canopy space than uh, single family neighborhoods. So a lot of that work we're taking a look at very carefully about how do we ensure that the critical ecosystem services that we all rely on uh, continue to exist in our urban spaces. Thanks. I might jump a little bit, Ken, to a question from Tanya that throws a, a variation on that question to Am. And it's about your, it's about Am's um, provocative uh, use of resilience as a quote BS word. So Tan Tanya says, thank you to all the panelists, but especially to Am for so much food for thought. As planners, how do we avoid resilience becoming the next, to quote you, BS word? Isn't it impossible to achieve all you laid out within this profession, planning? Uh, I would say, no, it's not. Uh, I'm obviously being um, uh, provocative because resilience is a word that gets used in so many different disciplines, but we always have to uh, look behind and interrogate words. It's very similar. My title at SFU is community engagement. That word gets thrown around in a very similar way in terms of what do we actually mean by that and getting into the material uh, policies and the work and how to um, look beyond and around those limitations is what's really fundamental. And I do think that planning, just like any uh, profession, there's a jargon that comes with um, how we think about, uh, orient ourselves uh, within the world and, and the distance from communities as Ken spoke about is, is quite fundamental. And, and there's a translation, uh, translational role and a mediation role that planners play that comes with a type of power as to how uh, ideas are being articulated and, and pushed through the system and something gets lost in the translation. And I think that's where uh, we need to think through and around these things in a much better way. We have things like business improvement associations where we give uh, money back uh, into uh, areas to have private security. Do we think about funding residence associations so they can engage in planning in a much more uh, autonomous way and, and come back to the city? Those things aren't really on the table in quite the same way. So I think that there's lots of examples from other places that we can draw on that would uh, uh, bridge some of that divide that functions currently. Am I'm going to keep the heat on you with a with a related question from David Sadaway, who who has some ideas about what insurgent planning actually could mean, and um, and ask for your opinion of that. So, a question for Am and others. I enjoyed your provocation and call for more insurgent planning. Do you think planners and politicos need to walk in the shoes of others more now, now more than ever, to engage in transformative planning? For instance, riding transit during the pandemic riding a bike or scooter during the pandemic, living in rental housing, or even joining a tent city and living closer to the ground. And just as a warning, maybe we could ask uh, Mayor Kennedy about that question too. Uh, I'm not gonna speak to the, the, the specific um, uh, examples there, but what I would say is that in uh, preparing some of my comments, I phoned uh, planners who work at the city of Vancouver. This was an amalgamation of uh, discussions uh, with people that are working inside of bureaucracies, and this might not be what they're able to talk about at the uh, coffee counter at, at, at work or the water cooler, but I think this is uh, for them who are working on the front uh, le level as, as planners dealing with these things. They're seeing the systems breaking and what isn't uh, working, and so I do think uh, supporting uh, communities in such a way uh, that is uh, closer to the ground is, is fundamental. Insurgent planning, uh, you don't need to be a professional planner to be an insurgent planner in a, in a way uh, our community organizers uh, are, are the ones that are uh, putting these things onto the table. <clears throat> and thank you. Um, a question next for Mayor Stewart. This is coming from James Long. Um, the arts community had a small crisis of faith this past spring as we waited and lobbied for City of Vancouver arts funding approval in the COVID moment. How do you see the long-term role of arts participating in the climb out of the pandemic, healing and perhaps an evolution of urban joy or happiness? 
Yeah, it's a good question and, and something that's really important to me. I mean, the reason I moved to Vancouver in the late 80s was because I was a rock musician and I uh, came here to play music, which I did for, for four years and it was a fantastic time of life for me. Uh, my brother uh, plays in a punk rock band called Bishop's Green and they tour all over Europe. So I'm very close to that side of the arts community uh, right now and I do attend other other events and uh, I totally see the stress that people are under. Uh, I mean, live music is endangered right now, if I can just take that, uh, that, uh, that avenue uh, with, with venues impossible to be open. Uh, and so I've been working uh, through a bunch of folks to see if we can get venues open in particular ways with the health authorities, with, uh, with engineering and other, other folks to see if we can do that. Uh, not having a lot of luck because we keep getting case increases. Uh, what we did in a larger sense in the city with, uh, was with grants as we've just announced a uh, cultural impact critical assistance program, which uh, it grants uh, one-time grants of up to $25,000. And that's available to, uh, to folks that are received grants in the spring. Uh, you know, we usually have conditions on grants that, that we uh, took all the conditions off and we just said, take your money and spend it on whatever you need it on to, to keep yourselves going. Um, so, I mean, we, we have some funding that we put through for grants and uh, what makes it tougher when, we, when our revenues are lower. Uh, the other thing is that just arts uh, folks, creators in the city are getting squeezed out of spaces. So we're desperately trying to, uh, those uh, larger art places, art creative spaces that are on city land is, is we're trying to uh, protect those and extend their, their life. So a big old warehouse where you can have numerous studios uh, that are not uh, so astronomically priced that folks can actually, uh, you know, all levels of art artists can be involved is, is something we're protecting. So we do have a very large uh, uh, strategy for this. Um, but, uh, you know, COVID makes it tough uh, with, with, with the funding. So the next two budget cycles are going to be very, very tough. Uh, that's why I'm so happy that uh, the big city mayors that uh, we had, uh, John Tory and Nenshi and uh, uh, Iveson, myself, uh, Doug McCallum, we lobbied and we got uh, a whole bunch of money from the feds for the first time ever for operating budgets for cities. So that's just being distributed through uh, cities now and that should really help. And I hope that's a trend that continues. I hope that the feds are interested enough and the province uh, provided matching funds that we can continue to fund, um, you know, not only keep our operations going, but to help, help the arts community uh, and, and really respond to their needs rather than telling them what they should be doing. Meg, I'm wondering if I could just jump in on the last question for a minute, is that okay? Um, the, um, I just wanna flag something because I think it's an incredible risk to any discourse and planning practice. Um, and I've seen it happen over the course of my career and I, quite frankly, I find it terrifying, which is this, um, which is planners hiding behind um, public consultation as a way of avoiding action and as a way of avoiding driving forward uh, policy that is going to be transformative. And I've seen it again and again. Um, when we talk about, for example, giving residents associations uh, funding from the city, I know in the Toronto context that our residents associations are primarily white, over 55 wealthy homeowners. Um, they have a tremendous amount of voice in, in, in the process already. And it's one of the reasons why we created something called the Planning Review Panel, that it's actually a panel uh, that represents the diversity of the city, both the geography of the city, it's 50% renters, it's 50% owners, it has ages, it has cultural diversity, it has gender diversity. Uh, and, and we did that, we created that panel through a civic lottery precisely to uh, respond to the imbalance to accessing power in the planning process. Um, that typically happens through very traditional consultation mechanisms in the city. Deputations at city council are typically undertaken by people who have a certain amount of political power already. And the role of the planner isn't to, um, isn't to hide behind those mechanisms, 
but is actually to be driven by vision and values um, and to see the opportunity for planning to actually advance transformative change um, and removing parking minimums as technical as and boring as that may sound uh, actually has a profound implication on access to housing uh, so you know those are actions that we just know are a good thing to do and the average person on the street has no idea what parking medium minimums have to do with the cost of housing but planners know that and planners shouldn't hide behind consultation but ought to be advocating for those policies and that's what we tried to capture as a starting point in the declaration is actions that we you know they, these are these should be very straightforward things to do that are not yet being done that will result and will begin to advance um, both a just and a green future in our in our city so I just want to kind of counterbalance um, that tendency, because it sounds good to talk about being very, very grassroots. And I see planners all the time that are immobilized to inaction and can't advance the most basic policy change because they're kind of trapped in this web of, um, of consultation that actually undermines what we know is in the public interest. And as planners, that's our professional obligation. And that is something that is absolutely contested and it needs to be negotiated and it needs to be discussed. But at the end of the day, all we need to do is fail to act. That's all we need to do. <laughs> all we need to do is nothing. So I think that's an incredible risk. If you're wondering what I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps, Meg, uh, on that note, uh, we ought to begin the wind up here. Would that be, would that, uh, be appropriate? It's very yeah. over time. Yeah. Uh, I just had, I had uh, just about I had six things that I took out of the discussion that I think uh, we need to think about and carry forward very, very quickly. Um, the first is that today's problems don't go away, uh, and we certainly heard that from, from Mayor Stewart. Secondly, we are in a unique moment in time uh, that uh, has huge opportunities uh, as well as huge challenges. Third, that vision and values are important as our principles, such as the responsible use of land as a sort of basic um, a, a concern of, uh, of, of making a better city. Fourth, the need to double down, and I guess we've heard this particularly from Metro Vancouver, the need to deal with the double down and deal with the media crisis, but also be flexible going forward and trying to make sure that we're able to develop solutions that are going to stand the test of time. Fifth, uh, the warning I think from Yunji that uh, democracy and engagement uh, could very easily become casualties uh, of, a, of an effort to focus on, on a crisis and to come out of a crisis so that we have to ensure uh, that our democracy and our de democratic principles and the relationship between the government and the governed are healthy. And finally, uh, I think a new view of what engagement and inclusion is uh, from from AM in terms of what the challenges are, uh, both to citizens, to elected people, and to professionals, of ensuring that the city continues to, or in fact, rediscovers or discovers uh, all of its population, all of the interests that it should be properly representing in a democratic community, uh, and what that means for the question of resilience, which I'm not yet prepared to call a BS word. So with that, uh, Meg, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you very much, um, Ken. And thank you very much to all of our panelists for a really stimulating discussion. I really feel like we've um, barely scratched the surface of uh, the things that we need to talk, to, talk about um, in relation to this question of long range planning. And um, here in Vancouver, elsewhere across Canada, um, the COVID context, the context of the long emergency, the context, context of the enduring challenges of living in society uh, together. And um, I just wanted to end by reminding you that the conversation does not end here. 
Um, here is a slate of the further discussions that we have planned right now with SFU Urban Studies. I hope that you'll be able to join us for more. They happen about monthly on Wednesday evenings in Pacific time like this. And then also just to share with you, if I can, yeah, the next session, um, and Aphrodite will put in the chat window the direct registration link uh, in October when we'll focus in on the question of kindness, which has come to the fore as a new kind of, well, as a, as a, as a unusual policy uh, directive and uh, motivation for action in COVID times in our, in our city. Thank you very much, um, Mayor Kennedy. Thank you very much to Anne. Thank you very much to Yunji. Thank you very much to Jennifer for waving the, the Toronto flag as well as the resilience flag. We do appreciate Torontonians in Vancouver conversations. Um, thank you to Heather. Thank you very much to Ken, uh, to the wonderful team at SFU Public Square. Apologies, I know some of you had trouble getting in. We'll, we'll sort out those wrinkles um, for the next time. Thanks very much and have a good evening.